Rural Route 1. What the? The ringing phone drags me into daylight. Hello? Ricky, is that you? Who the hell do you think it is, I want to say, but I can't. Yes, I on. It's me. What's up, Trixie? Don't call me that. I could picture her spit hitting the receiver and anyone unfortunate enough to be within three feet of her. Ricky, I need you to run the mail route today. Chester hasn't shown up. Maybe he's on his way in. Maybe he's on his way out. First off, Beatrice Hansen, the postmistress of Madsen, population 847, is my aunt. The second thing you should know, Chester Wallace, a retired farmer, is the most reliable rural delivery employee Aunt B ever had work for her. So if he's a no-show today, he's got his reasons. How soon can you get here, Ricky? Don't call me that, I want to say, but I don't. There's a lot of mail to sort yet, and it's shopper day. You don't have to get to your job until three, do you, Ricky? No, no, I can make it there in 15 minutes. No worries. Good. Coffee's on. I sit there in bed, staring at the clock until it flips through a couple minutes. Dang, it gets light early in June. The sooner you start, the sooner you finish. The voice in my head is a familiar one. So is my reply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have an official United States Postal Service uniform, so I pick out my sharpest looking short sleeve shirt. It's going to be a steamer today. My aunt used to let me ride along in the summers when my uncle was a carrier. I learned the routine. The routes changed some over the years, but not much, really. You still got the Norwegian farmers north of town and the Germans on the south side. The occasional stranger moves in and out of the old farmhouses that are now rentals. Then you've got the odd refugee from the city that comes out and buys a place to get away from it all. When I walk into the post office, Aunt B is sitting at her desk in full USPS regalia, down to the accommodating striped short wool trousers and sensible shoes. She's reading the latest official memorandum from the Postmaster General. She tosses her head back to point me to the bags of mail waiting to be sorted. Lynn, the newest and lowliest clerk, is sorting the townspeople's mail. She's late 30s, maybe 40, just a wren of a girl. I give her a wink and a nod before I dig in. Lynn is totally focused on her work, though, and doesn't look up. I start putting shoppers in all the slots, thinking they'll make a nice cradle for the smaller envelopes. Take those out right now. First class mail goes in first. You know that, Richard. Those smaller envelopes could get stuck in the pages and get lost. You know that, Richard. Lynn sniffs, then sighs. Or was that an inhibited sob? I don't want to know. I don't get women. I mean, I don't understand them. I can get them. But if they're on a tear or about to cry, I'm out of there. Right, Auntie. What Trixie wants, Trixie gets. I yank the shoppers out and start over. If you do it right the first time, the voice begins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pardon? Trixie's eyebrows create a land bridge worthy of General Patton's engineers. Just singing an old Beatles tune, you know, she loves you, yeah, 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 she... Aunt B isn't sure what to make of me and goes back to her memo. Lynn finally gives me a look over, so I stand tall and proud as I sort the American mail. And make sure those social security checks don't stick together. You know what happened last time. She turns to Lynn. Poor Mrs. Weeks ate cat food last November. I shrink a little inside my unofficial uniform, and Lynn drops her eyes. I finish sorting as quickly as I can. I want to hit the road. Haste makes waste. Shut up. I hoist the mail carriers. Lynn doesn't look at me again, even when I tip my green seed corn hat and joke, hey, I'm a mail carrier. Neither the females is amused. I help myself out the back door and load the mail into the van. It too suffers from a lack of authenticity, not being an actual USPS vehicle, but merely an adapted Chevy with a rack of flashing yellow lights. Aunt B has followed me out the door. Mind you, check the names and the numbers, she insists. And if you happen to see Mr. Wallace, tell him to call me. I'll need to fill out a form if he expects to get sick pay. Will do, Auntie. Again, Trixie isn't sure enough about the sarcasm to come down on me. 
I hope this doesn't make you late for work, Ricky. <laughs> Not to worry, Aunt Beatrice. I'll be done in no time. I slam the door shut, but she's got more to say. Drive careful now. School's out for the summer. The children, you know. I've backed the van up and put it into drive. I give her a wave as I pull away. Her fingers slide off the driver's door and along the van. Drive careful now. As soon as I'm on Main Street, I turn on the radio to drown out the voices. Some twangy whining thing instantly irritates me. I tune to a station I like. My fingers tap the steering wheel. The next song comes on as I hit the edge of town. School's out for the summer. What are the odds? Cool. I turn up the volume and cruise down the blacktop south of town, hitting 70, 80 on the country road. I'm in the next county before the song ends, and I have to head back and start the route. Rural Route 1. Stupid. There is no Rural Route 2. Not yet, anyway. But if these retiring yuppies keep moving out here, I guess there will be someday. Used to just be RFD or maybe a box number, but now these new folks use all these five- or six-digit numbers, so you'd practically need a GPS to deliver mail if you weren't from around here, like me. I've got job security two ways. I pull another U-turn and head for my first drop. That's what I call it, making a drop. When I rode with Uncle George, I used to pretend I was a spy, dropping off packages of secret info to double agents, maybe even triple agents. I was never very sure of that creepy Mr. Smith at Box 17 on Tower Road. He subbed for the history teacher a few times. But other than that, I only saw him sitting on a lawn chair, one of those big metal ones you see on old motel postcards, next to his fake wishing well flower planter in his front yard. He looked as pasty-skinned as scalded milk, even in July. He hung around my freshman and sophomore years, and then he was gone, just like that. The flag is up at Mrs. Carrington's place. She's had an Irish pen pal for decades. I put in her electric bill and pull out two letters written on flowered and scented stationery. I'd recognize her perfect penmanship anywhere. Mrs. Carrington was my third grade teacher. We had to bring in money for specially shaped pens. It was a big deal when they came, and we all practiced making circles and swirls and ovals over and over again. It didn't work like it was supposed to. My handwriting still sucks. But I always did like Mrs. C. She was a special lady. Is, I mean. Geez, she must be ancient. She was old when I was in school. I drive off, but then I remember I didn't drop her flag. And because it's Mrs. Carrington, I put the van in reverse and back up all the way down Baxter Road to make it right. Mail is important to old people. I want her to know I've been there and that her letters are on their way. Doc Tipler is next. I see he's getting some healthy diet magazines now that he's back from a fat farm out west. Better late than never, I guess. When he upsized himself, his wife downsized. She's got a new partner in the city, I hear. Beep! A red Mustang flies by, cutting me no slack. Richie Logan, get over it, I say. Me and Richie go way back. Second grade, in fact. He was a year behind me, but some teacher decided we should both be in second grade. We looked so much alike, and what with both of us being named Richard, it was November each year before the teachers called us by the right names, Richie versus Ricky. By then, if a teacher said Richard in that certain tone of voice they have, we knew which one of us she meant. The whole class knew. Richie Logan, Jr., son of Richard Logan, Sr., Box 28. I see the Mustang parked in the shade up by the farmhouse, and Richie is cool in his heels with his dad, who's got a monkey wrench in his hand and grease up to his not insubstantial biceps. A couple of rugrats play in a tractor tire sandbox next to the small ranch house. Grandma and Grandpa have the big house to themselves. Richie and Rhonda got the new one. I respect Richard Sr. He's done all right by me. When my mom hit some hard times, he saw to it we didn't starve. I seen him drop off a bike one Christmas night in the dark when I was supposed to be asleep. Mom said it was from Santa. But even if I hadn't seen Mr. Logan's pickup, I would have recognized Richie's old bike anyway. And at school that January, he wouldn't shut up about his new Stingray Spider bike. Whatever. I stuff boxes 18 through 20 on autopilot. Your basic prairie farmers, farm journals, auction flyers. 
Then, because of the stink, I intentionally hurry through 21 to 25, a cluster of boxes at the big pig farm. No trespassing signs all over the place. What the heck gives? Danger to who? There's swing sets and grills everywhere. Poor kids breathing that all day. Of course, I don't like to linger near cattle farms either. Or worse, when they honey wagon cow shit all over the fields, and then it rains, and then it gets hot. Ooh wee. Once when I was going to sub, I told postmistress Beatrice that I had an appointment in the city I'd forgotten about. The fresh air that day would have gagged me. I pass the Holtz farm next and see a little girl swinging under an oak tree. She reminds me of the stepdaughters that rode our school bus. Cute as a button. One of them grew up and shot her old man. Or was it the wife? I forget. I speed up for a half mile of open road ahead, passing an empty, overgrown place. The barn, leaning and sway-backed, is not long for this world. Joseph and Grace used to live there. She's gone. I think he's in the county home. Nice people. Old-fashioned. Married 65 years or something. Sweet couple. No kids, though, unless they ran off to the city before I was around. I don't remember. I slow down now for Coach's place. He moved in right out of college, married his high school sweetheart. They were both teachers, but she stayed home after their first bumble of joy. She left after their last one graduated. Maybe it was the smell being downwind at the hog farms. Seemed rather sudden, though. He must be lonely now, I think. I shove a piece of Miss Baker's mail into his box. Maybe he'll run it over to the old schoolhouse where she and Miss Boucher live. It'd be neighborly of him. Ah, uh, he'll probably leave it in the box for tomorrow. And if Chet tells Trixie, I'll hear about it good. Nah, I don't think Chet Wallace will tattle. He's pretty good-natured. He pretty much just smiles and says, yes, ma'am, no matter if Trixie is giving instructions politely or if she's nagging and ragging on him and or the world at large. I've never seen him get irritated about anything, not to where it showed anyway. Just for good measure, I shove Coach's latest pumping iron magazine into the Miss B's mail. They don't get out much either. I turn up the radio again when an old Moody Blues song comes on. They don't get much airplay these days. Neither do the Stones, but I guess teens nowadays hardly know who they were. Wonder where you are. I wonder if you think about me. Jenny. That's who I think about in my wildest dreams. I wonder where she is who she's with, what she's looking for. The sun is climbing, it's getting hotter, and there's no real clouds. I'm glad I got the route today. It's good to be out of that upstairs apartment. It's just a fixed-up attic. Maybe I can get a window air conditioner with this next check. Last summer, the heat nearly did me in. Working second shift helped, though. I'd be gone during the worst of it. Up ahead, I see the professor's wife out in her flower garden. But she disappears before I pull up to the box. She's a bit uppity. Or maybe she's just shy. I don't know her. Maybe she's scared to be out here alone. Her husband teaches at the college. Science, I'd guess. He's got a big telescope out in the backyard. He moved out here to get away from the streetlights in town. <laughs> he didn't bank on all the farmers putting in honking bright yard lights. I look across the flat land, and six miles away, I can see the dormitory towers rise straight up like the Tetons above Jenny Lake. Jenny, I've been thinking about her for the last three miles. I know you're out there somewhere. I can't get that song out of my head. I pull over on a field culvert and turn off the engine. The McQueen Dairy Farm is just ahead. Jerry and Jenny McQueen were in 4-H with me. Jerry did dairy. I did photography. Jenny did pork. Her dad had to go out and buy her a whole setup. He gave her a corner of the farm, and she did it, for a few years anyway, long enough so she could run for pork princess and get that scholarship. That and the bacon were her ticket out of Madsen. She moved into one of those towers over there on the east wing, and I don't think she ever looked west again. She quit taking my calls anyway. I told her once, I'm the needle in your haystack. Stupid of me. She never planned to stick around here. I lost track of her. I still had a year of high school left. Her brother had, too. It was rough for him, being of a different nature than her. 
It was bad enough that they'd call her Porky, Miss Piggy, and Princess Pig. They started calling Jerry the Dairy Queen. Kids. I browse through the McQueen's mail as I sit here. Nothing much of note. The old man passed on. The mother still raises some vegetables. And Jerry is a slave to the herd. I've never been lucky enough to see a letter from Jenny. You know, to check the return address, find out where she's at. There was a postcard once from Spain, of all places. That was years ago. But I keep hoping. You never know. You never know. I crank up the van and get it in gear. I better finish the route by one, or Aunt B will start asking too many questions and worry unnecessarily about me getting ready for work on time. I come finally to the Kingsley Estates. Well, that's what I call them. They came out here 15, 20 years ago from Chicago land somewheres. Sold their acreage there for a fortune when somebody wanted to build a mall. Showed up here and bought each of their sons a farm and built each of their daughters a stable. And mom and pop's place sits in the middle of it all. Land was cheap then because farmers were losing their shirts to the bankers. At least those poor ones southeast of town who sold out to the Kingsleys had to. I don't begrudge them the land, but they think there's something special they do. Like their you-know-what don't smell. Melanie Kingsley went out with me, though, once. I took her up to the drag races. She acted like her head hurt the whole time, with her hand over her eyes and looking down, brushing dust off her white skirt every other minute. Well, I could see where this wasn't going to go. I said to myself, she can just sit by her princess phone and wait for me to call her all she wanted. I wasn't about to waste another nickel on that one. Boxes 70 through 76. Finished. Finito. I drive an extra half mile east before I turn around. I get that Chevy van up to 92 by the time I pass Melanie's place and leave the estates in my dust, so to speak. It clears my head to have to concentrate on the road. My mind was getting a little overdramatic. I'm too nostalgic for the good old days sometimes. Up ahead, I see a tractor pull out onto the blacktop. I have to slow down now. As I close in, I see it's Gordon Johnson. I hit my brakes to give him a break. Now there's a sorry situation. Talk about bad luck, and not just with women. His firstborn son was killed by a birdbath. Unfreaking believable. Kid was, what, maybe two when he pulled that concrete bull off its stand? His wife was never right after that. It took her, too. His old tractor is plugging along. Looks small compared to what the Kingsley boys are running. I give him plenty of space when I pass him. I nod and raise a finger, even though he won't see it. Now I sail along until I come to the edge of town. I see the Monroe brothers with their heads all bent over the engine of an old Ford sedan. Only one of those shade tree mechanics has a clue, but I give him credit. He's kept his brothers together, in beans and jeans and out of the state home, since, since he was in high school shop class. He took some classes at the JUCO as well, and now runs a small shop out of his garage. People take him what jobs they can, out of sheer decency. I never saw their dad ever, and only rarely the mother. No one did. I don't know if she still drinks, but she did when it mattered, and only two of them kids came out right. Joe, the mechanic, and a sister who's married now, but sees to the groceries and laundry when she can. Saints, both of them, taking care of their own that way. Look out. There's crazy Lucy. da 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 do do that Wizard of Oz witch on a bike song comes into my head every time I see her. Lucy gets on her bike and starts riding around the block. She gets a wild look in her eyes and goes faster and faster and faster. Even the kids are scared of her. She's crossed the border. Manic, depressive, bipolar, something. Kind of like that woods guy that lives out by the dump. Except that, man, that guy never leaves the trenches. Thugwump. What the... I see a lump of squirrel in my rearview mirror. Or is it a cat? Shit, I hope not. Or some whiny kid's mom is going to tell Trixie. Well, I'll just cross that bitch when I have to. Bees Buick is in the post office lot when I return with the van. I was kind of hoping she'd be out to lunch. No luck. I drive at the insanely low posted speed limit and park carefully between the lines of the reserved space. I turn the radio back to the station I think it was on. Chet likes his country music. 
I grab the empty carriers and the new mail I picked up and go in the back door. Lynn's gone for the day. Beatrice looks up briefly. I set the bags down. Alice Baker called. Yeah? She thought you ought to drive right back out there and pick up Coach Thomas's magazine. I told her we were shorthanded today and just to put it back in the box for tomorrow. She went on and on, but I said good day and hung up. I said nothing. Ricky, you've got to stay focused when I give you a mail route. You've got to run, Aunt B. She shut up and sighed. Then, did you happen to see Chester Wallace's truck at his place? I didn't really notice. True enough. Well, he hasn't called in yet. Will you be able to run mail tomorrow again? I think of the window air conditioner unit I want. Sure. Working two jobs isn't going to be too much for you? <laughs> Not to worry, Aunt P. No problem. I'm backing out the door. Just call me. I drive the few blocks back to my apartment and climb the outside staircase. When I walk in, the heat and the smell assault me. I bag up the garbage, grab my fishing pole, and head down the stairs. I decide to drive the 15 miles to the old quarry instead of the river. I might want to jump in and cool off later. When I leave the blacktop and drive down the overgrown lane, I see I'm not the first today. Another vehicle has laid down ruts in the tall grass. Around the bend ahead, I see the back end of a silver pickup truck. Son of a gun, I say. Chester's here. You never know.